millions of vehicles every day. Multiple lanes, high speed. There are thousands of accidents on Britain's motorways every year. Very high speed impacts. Many are injured, some seriously, and for a tragic few, it can be fatal. In West Yorkshire, the motorway cops deal with the aftermath of all of these. A terrible scene. There's a young child involved. This is the ultimate sacrifice. To get to the root cause of every incident. I can smell drink. It's absolute garbage. It's like a jigsaw puzzle that you haven't actually found the pieces for yet. It's 2 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. PCs Dave Robson and Phil Stonebanks from the West Yorkshire Roads Policing Unit are on the M621 heading towards Leeds. It's either all or nothing on the motorway. People don't realise how dangerous it is. The cars are going twice as fast. People think because you're going in one straight line, you don't have to concentrate as much, but you do. Seven miles away, just south of Leeds on the M1, CCTV cameras film the flow of heavy traffic on a five-lane stretch. A black Fiesta slows to a stop just past the bridge. It's two minutes past two and a 999 call comes into the Wakefield Police Control Room. Such emergency. I'm stuck in the motorway, I'm right in between, I can't cross over during SOS. And the cars, they are really speeding, that it's quite dangerous to even cross over. The black Fiesta has broken down in lane two. Inside is a father with his two-year-old daughter. His call records the crash that follows. Right, so you're stuck in the motorway and you can't ring the SOS. Their, their car is really speeding fast. It might cause an accident because I'm right in the middle of the... <laughs> The call and the traffic building up indicate a major problem. Almost certainly a high-speed crash. Caller, speak to me. What's going on? A passing motorist has stopped at the scene and finds the caller's mobile phone. Where are you? Just north of the M62 junction. <laughs> the fire brigade arrive in just five minutes. The CCTV cam returns to observe the scene. So I okay. the injured? Yes, I'm okay. trapped in the car. The fire brigade are here. Right, fire brigade are there, yes? Are police yeah. there yet? No police, no. Right, they're on the way to you, all right? right. Dave and Phil are among those on their way to help. This is a major bottleneck where the M1 meets the M62. It couldn't have happened in a worse spot. It's so busy. There's so many fast moving vehicles. It was uh, the worst look that anyone could ever think of. Further north on the M621, PC Matthew Hemingway is the first officer at the scene. As we approach, we can see a couple of cars. Uh, there's a lorry parked up on the hard shoulder. As we get closer to this scene, uh, you can just see it's complete devastation, really. And then somebody walks over and tells us that there's a little girl who's been taken out of the car and uh, your heart just sinks. To avoid any further collisions, Phil and Dave divert the traffic off a slip road. Come on, keep going. Uh, we've just had an update from the scene. The uh, injuries are a bit worse than we first saw now, so they're treating it with a potential fatal road traffic accident, which means that we'll be shutting the motorway and it's going to be shut for some considerable time now. It does appear to be quite a serious one. Main concern is that one of the drivers who was seriously injured. 
I personally have a four year old daughter and an 18 month old son. When you see something like that, your heart and stomach just sink. You never want to be on the end of that phone call or being involved with your kids in something like that. New information from the scene is that everyone involved in the crash has survived. The father and daughter have been rushed to a and &E. I know it's hard to tell, but it's a Ford Fiesta that we've got over there. A lot of debris and engine spillage on the road. It turns out there has been three vehicles involved. We've got the HGV, the Fiesta and the Seat. The black Fiesta carrying the father and his daughter is a total write-off. The car's roof has been cut away to remove the trapped and injured driver. I believe the silver Seat is cut across uh, two lanes of traffic. It's not seen the Fiesta that possibly has been stationary in one of the lanes. Whether it had broken down or whether it's due to the amount of traffic, I don't know at this point. The rear end of the black Fiesta has been crushed beyond recognition. Luckily, the two-year-old girl was travelling in the front passenger seat. Well, it sounds things if she's in a baby seat, she can only be two or three years old. Being fastened correctly in a baby seat undoubtedly saved her life. While Dave begins to investigate the scene, 20 miles away, eastbound on the M62, are PCs Lindsay Pickles and Martin Willis. Somebody told me this afternoon it wasn't red. Martin is our motor way guru. Sat, sat the weather forecast. Yeah. Definitely. When I was a child, I wanted to be a motorway cop. I don't know why I have a fascination with the motorway, but um, maybe it's the fast speeds. It's a place where I do enjoy, enjoy working on it and do get a buzz from it. They spot a red Audi and run a routine check on it. It's shown up that the, there's no insurance link held on the uh, database. Hi there. Hey, right. Oh, I see you got off car full. I've looked in and I thought, oh, my goodness me, there's three children. With children in the car, the cops take extra care. Just here to chat about your vehicle, right? Um, we don't want to do it here. It's a very, very dangerous place to be using a hard shoulder. You've got vehicles travelling at excessive speeds. Martin decides to escort the driver to a safer B road layby away from the fast-moving traffic. I haven't said anything about the insurance yet. But before he can question the driver about insurance, he spots another problem. Um, how old are your children? Three, eight, and she's seven. Right, OK. Is there any reason why you've got this one in the front? She's too young to be that way around, yeah? She will snap her neck if you have an accident. Oh, the car seat? The car seat, yeah. Oh, I never knew it, so I was... Uh... Quite frankly, I couldn't believe my eyes when I looked in the car. Two of the children weren't restrained uh, correctly. It's dangerous. It's very, very dangerous, yeah. She, she potentially, if you have an accident, yeah, she wouldn't survive it because of the way she's trapped in like that. You understand that, yeah? It's not all about locking people up and, and waving the big stick. I like to think that you can educate people as well. Do you jump out and then just have a quick word with my colleague in the back of the car then? No, I'll stay with the kids, don't worry. Children are your most precious, precious thing in life. You have to protect them. Yeah, what's that? While Martin deals with the kids, Lindsay questions the driver. Hello there, you all right? Hi. Our systems are showing that insurance is not held. I'm not saying it isn't held, OK, um, but we just need to do some checks, OK. Do you know who you're insured with? Or... I don't, my husband done it. I am fully comp on his punto. Right, if you're a named driver on the punto, you wouldn't be covered to drive this vehicle. It's only the policy holder. We can't let you drive away if we think there's no insurance on the vehicle. If she has a collision with with another vehicle, they have nobody to claim against for their injuries or, or damage. So it is quite vast, really, the, uh, the consequences. Nearly 3% of all UK motorists drive uninsured, and along with hit-and-run drivers, injure over 26,000 people every year. While the cops get to the bottom of whether this mother is driving uninsured with her three children in tow, back on the M1 northbound, 
PC's Dave Robson and Phil Stonebanks are continuing their investigation into the crash where a silver Seat collided with a father and daughter in a black Fiesta. Very high speed impact if uh, you have an accident. At speed like that, it is going to cause a lot of uh, injury and damage. They've found an eyewitness, the same man who spoke to the 999 call handler on the driver's phone after the crash. A man who put himself at considerable risk to help the trapped drivers before paramedics arrived. The driver of the silver one um, couldn't get the door open from inside and uh, so I managed to prise it open and got him out. The driver of the silver Seat was freed from the wreckage and, incredibly, is not injured. But the Fiesta driver was not so easy to help. So we couldn't get the driver of the other one out. A terrible scene, I mean, to be as close as that was uh, quite frightening and it's, it happened so quickly, so suddenly. One of the good people of society even though all the danger's there, you could see someone else needed help. What he did was very brave, and I took my hat off to him. The witnesses confirm what the officers suspect happened. I think the black car was stationary with its hazard warning lights on the road had broken down. In 2013, there were 270 live lane breakdowns on this part of the M1, some resulting in fatalities. But because the two-year-old girl was strapped into a baby seat correctly, she's not become another statistic. She's escaped without a scratch. Well, for her to be uh, not injured is brilliant. You know, they're, they're robust. They're tougher than the rest of us out there. She's been very lucky, hasn't she? In that, if a little girl's been in that fiesta. Unbelievable. It was a twist of fate that saved the young girl's life. They put their child in the back of the vehicle, but today they had some stuff filling up the back seat, so they had to move the child and the car, child car seat into the front passenger seat. That decision saved her life because there was no back seats left, no boat, nothing. Breaking down in the middle lane is a motorway driver's worst nightmare. Police advice is clear. If a vehicle is still drivable, get it away from uh, the danger zone of the live lanes. But in this case, moving the broken down Fiesta was not an option. If they break down on the motorway, get out of the cars, get out as quickly as you can and move over to the hard shoulder. Your piece of metal can be replaced. It's you and your family that can't. It's now 10 to five on a Friday afternoon just outside Leeds city centre. It's one of the busiest times of the day on one of the busiest parts of the entire motorway network and the road's been closed for nearly three hours. Traffic is manic everywhere, tailbacks, busy, rush hour traffic. Finally, recovery vehicles arrive and the road begins to be cleared. We can start and get things opened up and, uh, and get the traffic moving again. Three months later, the driver of the Fiesta remembers his daughter's very lucky escape. She just came out with a bump on her head. That was a miracle. I look at life differently now because with this accident, it's, it's changed my perception of everything, really. Caston suffered some broken bones from the impact of the crash, but was released from hospital just one week later. Nevertheless, what started as a normal Friday for him and his little girl ended unimaginably. We were actually going to Leeds when we were towards M621. The car just started showing a, a warning sign, so I put hazards on. I could see from behind that there were cars speeding. We were stuck and we couldn't get out, you know, to go to the hard shoulder. I just sensed that this is danger and uh, I started panicking. So I just, I rang the police. As the Seat hit his Fiesta from behind, Caston was knocked unconscious. That's as far as I remember. He didn't know what happened to his daughter. I don't know what, what, whatever she experienced or what she, what she actually saw. Hmm.
Very distressing. <sighs> Months after the crash, and Caston and his daughter are driving again. I believe I did escape death, both of us. Fate. I do believe in it. And I hope this man has gone and started buying some lottery tickets. Very lucky, they were. Very lucky. Parked up off the M62, Martin and Lindsay are still dealing with a mother they think has been driving her three kids whilst uninsured. While Martin keeps the children occupied... Do make some funny faces? Well, that didn't work, did it? Lindsay's with the mother, who claims her husband deals with the insurance. Do you think there is insurance? You told me that you thought he'd taken a policy out for you on this car. Yeah, I'm not sure whether he has or not, I'm just assuming. Right. The only person with the answers is her husband. But she struggles to get in touch with him. She just has no idea whether he's insured it or he hasn't. I'm erring on the fact that it's not insured. She's not, she's not convincing me. The police sees two and a half thousand uninsured vehicles each week in the UK, and Lindsay may soon be adding this one to the total. There's no here, is there? Um, Documents-wise, just has to see, get her to check because he might just have put something in. Do you want to just check in your glove compartment, just in case he's put any sort of documents in the glove compartment or anything like that? You think it's empty? It's worth a look because I don't want to be taking the car off you that is. Genuinely insured. No documents found. It's, it's not a straightforward incident of no insurance. We've got the young children to consider. Martin and Lindsay decide to seize the car after driving them to the service station where the family were meeting Dad. Obviously, our concerns are getting kiddies home safely and with some food, really. Look, if you come and sit, you come and sit on there for me, yeah? But before Martin can drive the car, he has to set the child seats correctly, and Lindsay is left holding the baby. Do you want me to hold her? Let me just start and get some pieces out. Yeah. Hello, 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 baby. Yeah. <laughs> it's a cheeky. Are you cheeky? Can you give us a laugh? I am a parent, I've got uh, three girls, uh, so uh, well, it's a long time since, uh, since I held babies in arms, but, uh, but it soon comes back to you, I suppose. At the service station, Mum is given a ticket. You've been reported for the offence of driving without insurance. Obviously, when you speak to your husband, if he has taken in some insurance out for it, um, then... No, he hasn't. He hasn't, no, he hasn't, right, OK, then. But it seems Dad is the one at fault. She didn't see any any point in carrying on. She was happy to uh, to tell us that it, it's not insured. And he'll face the music when he arrives to pick them up. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thankfully, today Martin and Lindsay haven't had to deal with an accident. With three of the UK's major motorways, including the M62, M1 and A1, West Yorkshire's motorway cops, like PC Dale Anderson, are some of the busiest in the UK. Patrolling west on the M62, Dale is alerted to another potentially serious incident on West Yorkshire's stretch of the A1 motorway. And call us out to the fire. Yeah, received call five. We've just had a report on the A1 near Darrington uh, that there's a vehicle fire uh, in a live lane. I understand that the occupants are out of it, or at least three people are out of it, uh, but it's brought the traffic to a complete standstill. Uh, what I need to do is get there, firstly to confirm everybody is out of the vehicle, uh, and to try and basically make sure everyone's safe. With the threat of a fire engulfing live lanes and the occupants of the car possibly in the carriageway, Dale needs to get there fast. If a motorway is open and running, there's pretty much no 
more dangerous place to be on the on the roads of our country than than stranded out in a live lane. Thirteen miles from the accident, thousands of motorists are already caught in the tailback. So Dale takes to the hard shoulder. A busy motorway is probably the hardest road to actually get from A to B. If it's queuing traffic, there's just no room at all, which is when we'd usually revert to uh, using the hard shoulder. As Dale makes his way along the hard shoulder, he finds his progress blocked. I'm just conscious of this motorbiker who's number plate on our one because he's just driving up the hard shoulder, so we'll have a word with him at some point later. Dale makes control room staff at Police HQ aware of the offender's registration number. Can you just note the motorcycle that's just been driving down hard shoulder? So we'll just get him put on the log. He'll certainly be getting reported for driving down hard shoulder. And he's just causing an hazard, not just to us, but to himself as well. Just dangerous what he was doing and just pure impatience. Uh, so he'll get dealt with in due course. But with the rider back in line, Dale's run out of hard shoulder. This is where it gets very difficult for us now because we're losing hard shoulder. And this truck's always doing what he, he can to help. I want them split in now. Although many roadwork schemes are taking away hard shoulders in busy areas, they're an absolutely vital uh, safety area needed on all stretches of motorway. Luckily, fire crews joining the motorway at a junction ahead have cleared a path for Dale. And you can see it's just suddenly getting easy. We're here now. After 20 minutes battling through the tailback, Dale and the fire crews reach the car fire. As he approaches the scene... Hello! Dale's greeted by highways traffic officers already in attendance, and they have some good news. No one's injured. Fire brigade dealing with it. We've got stat removed. We've got recovery on route. Wonderful. So we'll get it off as soon as we can. What is it? I think it's not a collision, just an electrical no, fire or something. Fault, yeah. With the smouldering car cordoned off from the rest of the carriageway, Dale checks on the occupants. Hello. A family on a trip to the south of the country. Hello, are you all right? Yeah. A bit of a shock for you, I imagine. Yes. So, gentleman driving, are you yourself? Me. Oh, you. What happened? It just, I said to him, I think there's smoke coming out the back of it, and um, I, then the car in front of us said, are you ought to just, like, pull over? So pull over and stop. And opened the bonnet and just went, woof. Right. <laughs> right, well, main thing is you're all all right, isn't it? Yeah. Although Dale has years of experience policing the motorways, he still knows whatever happens on them can have a profound effect on those involved, regardless of the severity of the incident. Not until you're faced with actually being out on foot on a motorway and dealing with incidents do you, do you really take the seriousness of what can happen. Frightening but quick in a way, we just pulled everything out. I actually stopped at a broken down vehicle uh, and it turned out with my partner and my kids. It was absolutely heartbreaking to see the look of fear on their face and that's probably the day when my opinion of the motorway changed. It certainly really hammered home the, the personal element at that point and from my opinion it made me better because it made me realise we look at things very matter-of-factly. We deal with it all the time but it makes you really open your eyes to the, to the fear an individual may be facing at that moment in time. Safe in the knowledge everyone is OK, Dale's attention turns to the biker he spotted riding his luck along the hard shoulder. Hello, sir. You know why I stopped you? Yeah. Will you come and take a seat with me, please? The reason why I've caused you to stop is because when I was responding to this incident, yeah. you were taking was... option of driving all the way down hard shoulder, which is an offence. Could I ask why you were doing it? Um, well, I've got a deadline to meet. That's 
That's okay. the only reason. It is an offence in itself, OK, and I do propose to report you for that offence. Okay. The options for you would either be, they may offer you some kind of driver improvement option. As, as far as the uh, extra training is concerned, I'm actually doing this week the IAM uh, ah, training. Right. Uh, and, uh, I bet you didn't do that on your training, though, no, did you? No, I didn't. Despite the man's rider safety training, Dale isn't letting him off. I don't live in this country. All oh, right. You don't live in this country? No. Where do you live? Singapore. Well, that does change how I have to deal with you. As the rider lives abroad, he can't be reported and given the usual notification period to contest the offence. What I'm going to have to do is deal with you what we call a graduated deposit scheme. The graduated deposit scheme gives Dale the power to take direct action at the roadside, including taking a payment or even prohibiting motorists from continuing their journey. Right, we're just going to, going, so we're going to start dealing with money and things. Effectively, uh, it's how we deal with typically foreign drivers, but I appreciate yeah. you're British, but you no longer live here. Yeah. Um, and I what it will go. mean is I'll actually be requiring money from you at the roadside to be able to deal with you. Be. All right. Uh, and it's only in these unique circumstances we would. So, effectively, you prepaid your fine. I'm not going to lecture you. You know what I mean? You, you know what score is. As Dale deals with the rider, a recovery truck arrives to clear away the burnt-out car. But for its occupants, it's an experience they're still coming to terms with. I've just seen too much TV, I thought it was going to explode and we were all going to die. Scary. I didn't have my shoes on, ran out as far as I could onto the grass and got mud all over my feet. And so Dad had to run back in and grab my shoes, but it's a bit like muddy feet now. <laughs> Panicking a bit. <laughs> While the holidaymakers make alternative travel arrangements, Dale's actions mean the riders decided to make a detour to his journey. Cancel what I was actually going to go and do. So, right, um, you'll have me feeling guilty next. Yeah, sure, not. I'm sure. Not. <laughs> I'm sure you've got a real thick skin, actually. We want to enforce the safety message, whether that's sort of an old fashioned warning from the officer at the side of the road or you go to court. Uh, for any offences you commit, we've got to get that safety message across. I'll come out and I'll, I'll help you get out into traffic. And try and make sure everybody does get to the destination at the end of the day. Yeah, I showed her. It's something that maybe appears safe, but it, we drive along them quite frequently to get to incidents like this. But the one thing you must appreciate is you don't know what the people up ahead are going to do. And so vulnerable on a motorcycle. For the family travelling in the burnt-out car, reaching their destination is still the priority. What happens is the recoverers arrive, so they'll take the vehicle and they'll take the family uh, back with them, drop them off somewhere safe, and then this gent can make some arrangements in getting an insurance courtesy car delivered as soon as possible. Hopefully we'll be back on the road before, uh, before long. We'll get down tonight. We're into our destination. About five-hour drive. It's about 200 miles, 250 miles. Cheers, thank you very much. <laughs> One hour after the car fire, the family can finally continue their journey to the south of England. West Yorkshire's motorway cops police one of the busiest motorway intersections in the country, where the M62 and M1 merge to form the M621. In terms of volume of traffic, it's probably about as busy a stretch of motorway as we deal with. Just approaching this busy intersection at junction 29 of the M62, motorway cop Matthew Hemingway spots a car parked at the side of the carriageway with hazard warning lights flashing. You automatically think it's a breakdown. There's no hard shoulder at that area, so I went up to have a chat, see if everything were OK. What's happened? <laughs> I, 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 I was trying to get off this lane here. Yeah. And a, a man snuck in at the last minute behind yeah. me. And, and then he put his... Um, he, he just went fast and he went straight into the back of me. All right. And then he 
Did you, you drove off? Did he? Yeah. By driving away, the other driver involved has committed an offence. One of over 7,000 hit and run accidents each year in Britain. She's obviously very upset about it. Motorways are scary places. Cars and trucks are flying past you at 60, 70 miles an hour. But she got out of the car, she'd hopped over the barrier, and she was well out of harm's way. Did you know what type of vehicle it were or anything? I think it was an estate car. Right. It was a dark blue one, I think. She's in shock. Uh, you wouldn't expect her to come out with registration numbers, make, model, driver's age, things like that. We deal with a lot of these, but if that's never happened to you before, it's, it's quite a harrowing experience. Oh, what an idiot that stupid man is! Are you all right? Yeah. Give us your keys. I'll go and have a look at your car for you and we'll see what we can do. He wouldn't drive anywhere. She's quite panicky. She says she can't get a vehicle started. We'll see if we can get it back going for her. Jack of all trades, I think, police. Uh, you've got to, uh, you've got to be able to try and solve any problem that you come across, really, whether you know what you're doing or not. It seems the woman has suffered more from the bump than her car has. It's working. It should be all right. I think it had pushed the bumper in. It was rubbing on your tire, so I pulled it back out. Are you going to be all right to drive? I've got my boss and my boss is going to come down. Is he? I'm going to find out where we were. That'd be good. Hopefully this one of the cameras on here will have caught him. Yeah. I've got your details, we'll see what we can do. You think it was a blue estate car? It's not the most information we could get. Ideally, a registration number would take us straight to somebody's door. Eventually, two of her friends arrive. I'll get you a buzz later on. Yeah, thank you then. OK. All right, guys, be careful when you're setting off, all right? Now the pressure's on for Matthew to track down the hit-and-run driver. We are searching for the proverbial needle in a haystack, but that's what we're there for. And, uh, you know, I'll try my damnedest to, to try and track this guy down. Five miles away, Dale Anderson and colleague PC Doug Lofthouse receive word of another accident on the M621, on the outskirts of Leeds city centre. This will be us. Call reporting that it was approximately 50 miles before junction 42 of the M1. It's on the uh, M621. Shall we set off for it? Yeah. Yeah. The officers are minutes away from the collision, but travelling in the opposite direction. Oh, oh. Nice. Ah, that's where they open. The traffic has slowed to a crawl, but there are people in the live carriageway and the potential for a further accident. There's a, a couple of vehicles that are in lane three. Uh, the paramedics are already uh, at the scene. There are people walking about, so it doesn't look as serious as we first thought. Uh, but, but we're walking until we get there. All three lanes are, are queuing at the moment. If you're trying to hold at junction five, if people see if there's any injuries, uh, if there's no injuries, then we really should think about getting the carriageway up and, and running as quickly as we can. As you can see, traffic's backing up, but we don't want a, a further collision to happen further behind, where that could be a, a little bit more serious. Uh, Has he got a kid in his hand? It's, it's not looking like it uh, may not be required, but I've been able to assess, obviously, yeah. this All right. got one ambulance So, possibly non injury Dale's making sure all three lanes are blocked off and the carriageways are safe for the people involved in the crash. Hello. We just need to get these cars over what have been in an accident. So if you could just wait and then nobody can get by and it makes it safe for us. Thank you. All I'll do is explaining to those drivers, if they can wait, the importance of the, them waiting where they are because we're basically physically blo blocking the road off for us. We can get everybody safe, learn to be hard shoulder and get all three lanes running again. So it minimises disruption and we know we've got a safer working environment. With all those involved now on the hard shoulder, the carriageways get moving again. And Dale and Doug begin to work out what caused the accident. For the driver of a grey Passat, it's been a terrifying experience. I was on the inside, Hello. the guy in the truck was on. 
Right. And then I just felt the big bang. And right. suddenly I was across the front of the vehicle. As distressing as it may be for all those concerned, the officers still need to determine if they need to take action against the drivers involved in the accident. 99 times out of 100, we never witness the actual uh, event itself. We just go there and pick up the pieces and try and deal with it from that perspective. Incidents of this nature are traumatic for many, many people. It may well be the most stressful and traumatising incident they ever have to deal with in their life. She's been totally broadside across the front. How long, how far have you pushed her? How far have you pushed her along? Not very far at all. No problem. I think she was here, drifting here. Yeah, but what he's saying is, he's been lane two, she's been lane one. He's had her in all three mirrors alongside and for some reason she's just pulled out come into lane two and they scooped her up, basically. Witnesses in any collision, really, are invaluable. We weren't there. If it's not captured on some form of CCTV, uh, the physical evidence will give us a very good indication, but it could also leave some unanswered questions. We've taken a very quick account from all the witnesses. She's been shunted down the road by a uh, quite a large vehicle could have been quite different on a different day, uh, so she's fairly lucky. She's currently in the back of the ambulance, just being looked at, but just to make sure she's not injured. As the paramedics assess the lady's condition, and Dale and Doug continue to investigate the cause of the crash. Back on the M62, Matthew Hemingway is dealing with the hit-and-run accident. He's going to the highways agency CCTV control room, hoping that the motorway cameras may have picked up the car that drove off. It's a big job. All we've got is a colour and an estate car, really. But we know what time it happened, and we, we know her car, so we should be able to pick her car out on the video. So anything near her around about the time, uh, we should be onto a winner. There, it is. there, right, OK. It'll be worth the effort. 180 CCTV cameras cover Yorkshire and the North East's motorway network, with 56 on the M62 alone. Around 5% of motorway accidents are detected in this way. But only three cameras cover the stretch of motorway where the accident happened. Oh, so that's about the right time, Ashton. Yeah, so it was actually not pointing at its own position at the time of the incident for some reason. Unfortunately, the camera's facing the wrong way, uh, so we've drawn a blank on that one. Majorly disappointing. Yeah. It's not looking good at this point. Matthew and the control room team manager's next port of call is footage from before the accident. Night, if we could see her going past, she's in a black mini. Right. You're just looking at hundreds and hundreds of vehicles going past and trying to pick out First, her car, and then secondly, the car that yeah. might have hit her. I'm the eternal optimist with things like this. I always expect to catch people. <laughs> people call it luck. You make your own luck. It's just a minor accident, but I'm always looking at it from the police side of things as well. There's always a reason that somebody's failed to stop, and that's why it would be great to try and track them down. We've just seen a black Mini, but I don't think that's the one we're after. God, I can't take the suspense. No, there's nothing obvious there, then, is there? I don't think so, unfortunately. Hmm. Oh, well. I promised I'd find it, and it, it grates me when I don't get to the bottom of stuff. Well, this guy's obviously given no thought to this poor woman. He's left hysterical at the side of a motorway on her own. I'm still annoyed I didn't find him. Back at the scene of the accident involving the driver of the damaged car on the M621, while paramedics continue to run some checks on her, Dale Anderson thinks he may have found a clue to who or what may have caused the accident. The matter here doesn't really warrant us closing the motorway to look at these marks. But just beyond that white line, you can see the commencement of a skid mark. 
the impact has actually occurred right where we're standing here. It's consistent with the fact that the Passat's come in front and, and been rotated around whilst he's been fully in lane two, as opposed to him moving across into the Passat. Doug inspects the damage to the side of her car to see if it's drivable or will need recovering from the motorway. It is quite badly damaged, but there's no, nothing sharp. All tyres are inflated. I'm confident she'll be able to get back in that if she's uh, obviously well enough to drive, which I just want to get her blood pressure down. As soon as I've done that, I think she'll be free to leave. If there's any kind of collision in peak hours, it's generally a five mile an hour, 10 mile an hour, where somebody's just having a momentary lapse of concentration. I hate to think what the shock of finding yourself stuck, caught around the front of a truck is because you're totally powerless to act. Uh, the truck weighs so much more, it's not going to offer the slightest bit of resistance. And just as Dale thinks the matter is dealt with... And there comes the additional danger of people slowing down to watch what we're doing, concentrate on what's in front of you, because now we've got another RTC just further back. So these two have been caught up as a consequence of what people down here have been doing. Those people are now continuing on to their Friday night at home, and these have got an accident to deal with. Are they all right? Nice one. Yeah. Some people may spend their entire working lives driving up and down on motorways and never, ever come across any serious incident. But you never know what is around that corner, and it's that one time when you're not expecting uh, to see something in your path where, where it's all going to go wrong for somebody and it's just a case of treating every journey like you would your driving test and give it your full attention uh, and make sure you're able to stop if the unexpected is around the corner. As insurance details are exchanged, the Passat driver's been passed medically fit to drive again. So they're just literally finalising the paperwork from their side of things and the lady will be getting in the car and driving. Uh, I've said that we'll hang about five minutes, obviously, and follow her at least until she gets up uh, on the motorway and running again. And if there's any problems, I've told her to pull over and we'll assist her, but I'm not envisaging there'll be any problems. This time, with no serious injuries and no one deemed to be at fault for the accident, no action will be taken against either of the drivers. But in 2012, 87 people were killed in accidents on the motorway, and in over half of those, driver error played a part. Nighttime brings new challenges for West Yorkshire's motorway cops. It's not only road safety they deal with, but with two major cities on their doorstep, they're often asked to help out in the surrounding towns. PC James Alderson and PC Dick Infield are patrolling in Dewsbury, south of Leeds. Is there a McDonald's in there? It's got 24 hours there. I didn't want to wait for this At 4.30 a.m., they receive a call from a Leeds unit. We've got a fail to stop, fail to stop on Huntsman Road. They make their way to the area to help bring the car to a safe stop. Six o'clock, can you show us a tenant that must be We're now behind the Nitter uh, Bank. When we've heard it's going towards the motorway, we're thinking, well, hopefully it may well come southbound, which is towards where we are. The last thing we want to be doing is put excess pressure on them, make them drive more dangerously, which quite clearly puts members of the public at, at great, great risk. But the micro driver has other ideas. Entry down to M1 on downtown carriageway. Yeah. Go right. This potentially could, uh, could get a bit dangerous. That is the worst, the worst thing that could ever happen in a pursuit. Once you're committed, you're committed in the wrong direction. It's just sends shivers up your spine. It's, it's an awful thought. Heading Straight up. On, uh, M1. The other traffic cars aren't monitoring it but they're not pursuing it on the wrong side of the road. So we're going to make our way into the area in case it comes off. 
If that hits something, head on. Go left here. We've come full length out of Joe's Bridge, it's not past us on 653. It, it's crashed and it's looking like a uh, potential. Go on, and one north. The kid who's found the car. And it's, uh, they said it's crashed and it's looking like a potential vehicle. It very quickly turns into your worst nightmare. The saying it's carnage, absolute carnage. You then become fearful of who's involved. We don't know who's potentially fatally injured, whether it's the person in the micro or if it's the uh, if it's hit something head on. Is it gonna be somebody that's just minding their own business? Driving to work, that's a person that's potentially fatally injured. It had disaster written all over it when, we, when they said it had gone the wrong way, down the uh, down the wrong carriageway. Two vehicles, it's just a men's delivery van head on. Ultimately, we're all human. The first thing you are thinking is, what are you going to find when you get there? More than six police cars are on their way. But James and Dick are one of the first to arrive. Oh, jeez. Devastation. Carnage. There's a male on the road at the side of the car. You can tell when somebody's in a bad way just by looking at them. Um, that's experience, that's from going to numerous collisions over the years. This car that they've been uh, looking for, it's trying to come round um, a, a bend and it would appear it's hit uh, a wagon. Their first concern is the car driver. So we're just going to go have a look. <laughs> Certainly not moving. We could do with finding the driver of the, uh, the van, make sure they're OK, cos they're going to be quite shook up, I would have thought. Let's just get our wagons turned round. It'll look at scene preservation, don't we? The motorway will be closed immediately to avoid any disturbance of evidence that could be vital for an investigation, while cops start finding out exactly what's gone on. You all right? Has he just come flying towards you this way? The driver of the blue van appears uninjured, albeit in shock. It's been just eight minutes since the crash, and paramedics are still some minutes away. But firearms officers, the most highly medically trained officers in the force, are here to tend to the micro driver. The cops know that the next few minutes will be crucial. <laughs> 17 miles west in Bradford, PCs Martin Willis and Lindsay Pickles are approaching the end of their nine hour night shift. You're starting to relax, you're thinking the, the night shift's over. But then a red car catches their attention. Very no slow. When you see a vehicle driving round that slowly uh, at that time in the morning, you're thinking, have they been out drinking? Is it their vehicle? No idea. Certainly worth a check. Lindsay runs the details through the police system. I think it's all in order. Well, it appears to be yeah. on here. Yeah. But... <laughs> it doesn't appear to be in front of us, does it? Seems to be going around in circles as well. Probably. Martin decides to pull him over. Oh, he's off. He's off. He's off. He's off. <sighs> in this case, he wasn't for stopping. No. Number 10, go 6 1 urgent. And all of a sudden, bang, got a pursuit situation on. And then suddenly you've then got to bring yourself, think right now, concentrate time. It's game on. 6-1, we've got a vehicle failing to stop. Um, Morley Street, out of city, Vauxhall, Astra. Can I take the up there? Yes, yes, we're now Canterbury Avenue. Speed is now 50 miles an hour. Road surfaces are wet. No other traffic on the road, safe to continue. Do you have any of the units in the area? We have to take back authority, please. The officers need permission to continue an increasingly dangerous chase. And they need other units to assist. Knowledge, still safe to continue. We're still it's an Enox road, speed is six zero miles per hour. Vehicle is two up, driver and front seat passenger. We still don't know who he is, um, what his background is, what his intentions are. Um, so it, it's always uh, a difficult and dangerous situation. Stand by. 
he was not stopping at giveaway junctions, crossing uh, roundabouts. So if there's any other vehicles on that road, the high potential is for, uh, for a serious uh, collision. Do we have any units close by? Driving over a tonne of metal in the manner of his driving, you know, it's just a menace. We have got a vehicle behind us. The runaway driver's hitting 80 miles per hour. Yeah, we've got another vehicle ahead. On quiet roads, and with at least two other units now in place, it's safe for the officers to use their tactical pursuit and containment training. In a strange sort of way, it's quite an exciting thing to do when you're following a vehicle that's failing to stop, but you've got to, you've got to rein that, that feeling back in. They need to act fast to box the driver in before he heads into town and puts other drivers at risk. It's a very intense situation. The car isn't giving up. At 60 miles per hour, he's still attempting to evade capture. Yeah, we're still rolling. Finally, he makes a mistake. But it's not over. The driver's out. Martin has the passenger. You're right, Martin. While the other officers catch the driver. Get behind your back. Behind your back. Now. He was just uh, ready to fight. Stop, hold on, hold on. And, and, and did. So he had to be brought to the ground. Two on. <laughs> the car's not stolen, but Lindsay thinks she knows why he ran. I can smell drink as I've been trying to get the handcuffs on him. Um, but uh, luckily, with no damage, no other members of the public involved. Right, I'm going to ask you for what I call a roadside breath test. Have you ever done this before? Yeah. Yeah. Last night. Last night? What was the result? I'm drunk here, but I can't drive this to me. You couldn't drive? The reason why he ran away is more complex than Lindsay first thought. He'd only been released in the early hours of that morning uh, for a similar sort of thing. Just beggar's belief, really. He obviously realised what was going to happen should he have stopped. Right, you failed the roadside breath test, OK? So, on top of uh, dangerous driving, failing to stop, you're also under arrest on suspicion of driving whilst over the prescribed limit, OK? To continue to do it within 24 hours is just... Uh, it's unbelievable, really. Each year, there are more than 250 deaths from drink drive accidents on Britain's roads. My family could have been on that road. I'm just out of contempt for people like that. Absolutely out of contempt. And his passenger doesn't seem best pleased either. I'm angry. Cool. Should we get in the car with him, mate? Had your friend yeah. been drinking? Yeah. Uh, two water. Uh, yeah. Thomas Cross. Thomas Cross. It's whiskey, yeah. 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 Maybe giggle a bit. <laughs> Not thinking I've any capability to drive if we've had that much. Back on the M1, it's a much more difficult end to the night shift for James and Dick. A Micra has collided head-on with a van, leaving the driver with life-threatening injuries. The cops are trying to establish what happened from the only witness. He's actually driven through it, stopped, and then rung it in. You've got all his details? I've got all of his details. A uh, bit shaken. As I came round the corner, it's just that there was a, a mangled wreck in the road. I'm just relieved that I wasn't maybe five minutes ahead um, this morning, um, and it, it could have been me. You know, I feel, feel for the van driver. This is a journey on the M1. He won't forget. I live round the corner, so I use it every day, virtually. But I'll always remember coming round this morning. Yes, eight, 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 the van driver has escaped with bruises, 
but the young car driver is still fighting for his life. This is the worst it gets. The worst it gets. It, it makes you. It makes you shiver. God knows how fast here we're going coming all the way. It, it's just no one expects anybody to be travelling the wrong way down a motorway. Nobody. It's. It's not what happens. Paramedics join the firearms officers to try to save the driver. To touch the patient. Start CPR. Give 30 compressions. They tried. They tried for quite some time to revive him. Analyzing rhythm. It is now safe to touch the patient. Start CPR. It's not looking good. We had confirmation from the paramedics that um, the driver of, of the Nissan Micra um, has been pronounced dead. This is the ultimate sacrifice for his actions, the ultimate sacrifice. You have to separate yourself. You have to separate your home life from, from, from your working life. Ask me if I've ever thought about him since. Yeah, I have, because I've driven on that road. But I don't take it home because if not, I'd have no family life. Had the accident happened on this stretch of the motorway just two hours later, in the middle of rush hour, there could have been multiple fatalities. I'll never forget this incident. I know the van driver will never forget it, and I know the family of this lad will never forget it. Collision investigator Martin Ward has only a few hours to build a picture of what may have happened. Although you've got all this disruption to the frame of the mica, the collision probably occurred about five to ten metres further back. The early indication from our collision investigation unit um, is that, and from speaking to the witness in, in the van who's obviously gone off to hospital, the van driver's been coming this way and has seen this, the, the, the mic have been driven by the deceased. Um, he's attempted to swerve over towards the hard shoulder. Um, however, on doing that, um, this vehicle, um, the mic has also moved onto the hard shoulder. There's obviously a lot of investigation still to be done. That's the early indications. As daylight breaks, the on-scene investigations come to a close. Rush hour is fast approaching, and at last, one of the busiest intersections of the M1 can reopen. With so few witnesses, CCTV camera evidence is crucial. It captures the moments the van drives down the slip road and comes face to face with the car, heading in the wrong direction of the motorway. It must have been absolute desperation to do that. Why did it will be forever a mystery? After further investigations, it was found that the car driver who went the wrong way up the M1 was more than three times the prescribed drink drive limit. The runaway driver, who eventually got caught, received 10 months in prison and a 12-month driving ban. Officers never found the driver who caused a collision on the M62. The uninsured mum of three was given eight points and a £110 fine. And the crash that followed the father breaking down on the motorway with his daughter was considered an unavoidable accident and no charges were made against anyone involved.